Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the inaugural 2022 uh, Mara Guest Lecture. It is our pleasure to host Ray Holiday from the St. Louis Zoo and from the Institute of Certified Record Managers today. Uh, it is a real pleasure to have you here with us. And I am now going to hand the floor over to you, Ray. So oh, yes, so thank you for inviting me to give this guest lecture. I can hopefully do this every year, which is exciting because not all, I'm wearing a lot of hats here. So um, I'll start out with just a brief introduction of myself and then we'll go to the next slide and I'll kind of give you the topics that I'm gonna talk about today. So the focus of this presentation is leveraging your RIM education and certification in the zoological registrar profession. So I'm gonna give you a lot of zoological registrar specific information, but I'm also going to balance that with the global certification along with your education with the MARA program is really gonna put you in the best case situation to be able to secure some of the best records or archival jobs out there today. Um, I. I started my career really young, at 17. I was in high school and, you know, my family history was I lived on 12 acres with my parents. My dad was a blacksmith, so he not only shooed horses, shod horses, he broke horses. He was a rodeo performer for quite a few years. Um, he bred quarter horses, so we always had quarter horses on the property. Because we lived in the country, I was always taking in stray animals. I mean, I had all kinds of pets. I had many dogs, many cats. I had a pet raccoon, which I wouldn't advise now that I'm in the zoo profession. But back then, it was like nobody knew that wasn't the best I don't. And I loved my raccoon. He was pretty awesome. And so... To make a long story short, my parents loved animals and they passed that love on to me and they I was surrounded by animals my entire, um, you know, till I was in my 20s. And then, of course, from that point on, I always had a dog or a cat of my own and um, my high school counselor. So I only had to work. I half a I only had to go to school half a day in my senior year and I was trying to find a job that I could do with animals. I knew I didn't want to be a veterinarian. It just wasn't my thing, but I did want to work with animals. And my high school counselor suggested I apply to the San Antonio Zoo, which is where I'm originally from. She knew the zoo director there. Well, I was able to get a job. I worked in all the concession stands. I worked in the gift shop, not with animals, but all day long, all the animal people were all out and about. And I was able to meet them. And eventually, when I started my first stint with college in northern Wisconsin towards a biology degree, I was able to be a part-time keeper during the summers for the zoo. So I did that for two years. Came back after my second year, did not want to go back to northern Wisconsin. Okay, I'm a Texas girl. I don't know how I didn't freeze to death the two years I was there or even get around. I, I didn't have snow tires on my car. I was, it was just awful. And so it took me a little bit to get back to finish my formal education. But what I was really trying to do right then was to get a full-time keeper job because I wanted to work my way up and eventually become a curator and manage an animal collection. Well, no full-time keeper jobs were open. This is, this is what happens in our, as we're working our career through, we have to deal with all kinds of unexpected barriers, limitations, not being able to get the job we want. We have to be willing to get our foot in the door and then work a plan to get that dream job, right? And so this records job came up. It was like animal records, Clark. I'm like, I can do this. I can get this and you know, I'll do it for a while. And as soon as a full-time keeper job comes open, then I'm gonna be you know, onto that. Well, I got in that position and I, all my records manager genes that were hidden inside of me were coming out, right? That's like the organization, working with the records. Sorry for my dogs are barking. They'll be quiet in a second. They're barking at the trash guy outside. And, uh, 
you know, I just realized I really love this. I still work with all the animal people, but I'm getting to do the business side, which I really like too. So after five years of doing that, they promoted me to what is registrar. Now that title is a little misleading. I think it's a little antiquated and obsolete for what this position does today. But nonetheless, my title hasn't changed yet. I I manage all the animal records. I did at San Antonio Zoo, uh, all the animal shipments, all of the permit compliance. So very heavily weighted on records management, but also compliance and then other stuff in between like shipping animals. But in order to ship animals, you have to generate the correct records. You have to be able to, there's a huge impact to the records because it's so highly regulated. And you have to make sure that when you're shipping animals that they get there safely, that animal welfare is a huge consideration and there's just a lot of coordination and stuff. So, so they sent me to my first Association of Zoos and Aquariums conference and when I went to that conference, it was amazing. I met so many people and I met the director at the St. Louis Zoo and they were looking to hire their first registrar. I got the job and I've been there ever since. So I just celebrate well, January 14th was my 31 years at the St. Louis Zoo. And um, in the mid nineties, so I started there in 91, I realized how many records the zoo had. It had been open since 1904. So just a ton of records. And I, I just, I didn't know a lot yet about the, the holistic part of records management, but I could tell that we needed to be doing more than they were doing at that time. I was able to get a local records grant from the state of Missouri. They had a new grant program. And I, I over the time, over that, over the nineties, I got several of those grants and we microfilmed all the historical Records at that time, microfilm was the best thing going, right? Um, and that evolution took place now. So I've gone through all the various, I got my certification with the Institute of Certified Records Managers. I finished my formal education. I got my MBA, which has served me really well in this position. And really, it became my lifelong career goal to elevate this position in zoos and aquariums. They need the skills and competencies provided through the ICRM certification. Definitely, if many of these people can go back and get their education or they're just considering education, all the partnerships that we have in place now to help them get both, you know, at the same time is wonderful. So that's my story. Um, you know, I network and I mentor and coach many records managers across so many different audiences, not only in the zoo profession, but with ARMA, with the schools, with the ICRM members and candidates. So it's it's something that I'm very committed to. And I just, I love helping people because as you can read from the story I just told you, there was nothing. I had, I had to want all of the stuff that I've been able to work on and get to and achieve for myself and for others took a lot of hard work. So, but hopefully, and I think that it has had some really positive impact for those that'll come after me. So let me go on to the, um, so we talk about the education. So the path, there's several paths here. We'll talk about the MARA program at San Jose State. So you are really in the most amazing program. Um, Dr. Franks worked really hard to align that program when it first started to the ICRM outline and under, you know, having a, a deep understanding of records management and what the program needed to be current day. And so that is wonderful. And I know that Dara is working on, you know, taking that to the next level. Um, RIM certification, the Institute of Certified Records Managers. So they started in 1975, and at that time, Emmett Leahy, which I'm sure you've heard of by now, you know, they did all the work in the federal government, the early work of federal records management 
implementing what now we know is a records management program, record centers and all those different things. Um, but there was, you know, from that outcome, there were records management professionals working in the federal government that realized there wasn't anything. There were very limited program education programs in place for the wider scope of records management. Always been library science always been archives, but the records management and the differences with all the things specific to records management weren't there. And so the certification, a process by which you can be benchmarked against your peers, a global process, so not U.S. specific, but, you know, is really needed to help advance the room profession. And that's how the Institute of Certified Records Managers began but even today, with so many education programs, there's still many that don't have access to those programs, or they've been in the field too long to justify going and expending that kind of money to get a formal REM-specific degree. So it's still extremely relevant. It's also relevant because once you're done with your education, you're done learning, unless you have a certification that forces you to keep your skills up. You're going to conferences, you're doing projects that apply the skills you learned in your education program, but also what you've been tested on through the Institute. So really, really important. Now talking a little more industry specific, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, that's a regional zoo association AZA is the North American Regional Zoo Association, but there's others all around the world. Um, and they are an advisory organization to zoos and aquariums in North America that are members of a AZA. They provide standards and accreditation standards. The zoo I work for is a member of AZA. And I had the opportunity in 2019 to lead a task force. They asked me to lead a task force on updating the record standards. And a result of that work was we had a committee of, I think, a total of about 10 people across all different positions. I led this part specific to record standards, and um, that resulted in five new record standards for AZA zoos and aquariums, which I never thought it would happen in my lifetime. So I was really, really you know, because some of the stuff you need that overreaching highest authority to say, you need to do this. So those record standards are now tied to accreditation. You, ha you have to do them in order to meet your accreditation requirements. That includes having a retention schedule for animal and veterinary records. So these are standards under the animal welfare and care. Um, it includes using a, a electronic records management system. There's only a few in use for the kind of information we capture, but we're using the largest one. Um, business continuity plans, preference for electronic records. So the preference is supporting the transition away from paper. So that is uh, helping. It's helping with all the efforts that the Zoological Registrar Association, ZRA, has been working on since 1984 when it was formed. We do have an ICRM mentorship program, which I'll talk about a little more, um, but really that is the premier association to help you if you're looking to be a zoological registrar. Um, we have a training certificate program. We have an annual conference. We have a listserv, which is fantastic. It's really a great, and, and the annual dues for a professional member are only $35 a year. So it's very affordable. You can also be an associate, which means you have an interest in records, but you're not uh, in a professional registrar position yet. And then lastly, I'm gonna touch on the uh, St. Louis Zoo virtual internship that we established with San Jose State University in 2020. So uh, I did want to just spend a couple of minutes here. Um, there's a couple of links here which are really important to you. But in 2017, we formalized the partnership with San Jose State, meaning the Institute of Certified Records Managers, 
formalize the partnership with San Jose State University to provide a credit for parts one through five to those graduates of the MARA program that had completed the courses outlined in the MOU. Um, because you also have to have the internship project, the consulting project, I forget the exact name for it with your school, but that's part of the requirement as well. And we allow that to be used as your one year of professional experience if you don't have one year of work experience yet. That's a hardcore requirement of the Institute. Even if you were going through the ICRM process directly to take the examinations, in order to qualify to sit for the exams, you must have one year of professional experience. So the reason why we're able to approve that, that internship is that is because, um, you know, you have, uh, when we instituted this, Dr. Franks was at CRM, Lisa Dalby's at CRM. So all of the students are working under the direction of someone who holds one of our credentials. But, the because of the strong crosswalk to the exam outline, you're getting the best case scenario to be able to talk about the courses real quick. Um, this is the page. If you haven't been there, Sarah, um, oh, did I get your name wrong? Megan, um, is it Megan Ward? Yeah, yes. Um, sorry, Sarah was our first virtual internship with San Jose, so I kind of had her on my brain. Um, so this here explains this link here that's on the slide. You've probably already been here and is aware of this, but it explains the difference between the certified records analyst or CRA and the certified records manager. So the CRA we launched in 2016, and we recommend that all candidates and applicants uh, get their CRA first. So if you're in the MARA program and you meet the requirements for the partnership, I would strongly recommend that you apply to the Institute. Um, when you apply, you will select the application that is the San Jose State CRM testing application and go ahead and indicate that you want to accept your CRM, your CRA first. Then you have an unlimited amount of time to pay, take part six for this to get the CRM. Um, that just takes the pressure off of you. If something comes up, life gets in the way and you're not able, then by getting your CRA first, you don't have that. You must get all the parts passed within five years, or then you have to start actually taking the exam. So you don't want to end up in that situation. So you can graduate, apply to the Institute and accept your CRA immediately after graduation. You will um request from uh, Dr. Ha you know, from Dara, you will request from her the verification letter. And in that letter, once the transcripts are reviewed and everything, she will confirm that you have satisfactorily completed the following five required courses. MARA 204, 210, 211, 249, and MARA 284. And then also, you've hopefully completed the internship. Now, remind me, Dar, the internship is required, isn't it? It is no, not a required course, but it's a highly recommended course. Okay, so if you have completed that, when you apply to the ICRM, you're gonna upload that letter that she gives you twice. One, so that they know that you've, you're in this partnership requirement, you've selected that particular application, this verifies that you kept passed all the courses needed, that you met the partnership requirements, and then you upload it a second time if you need to use it for your one year of professional experience. So that's how you take advantage of the partnership. You know, I would encourage just just make sure that you stay up on this and you understand what you have to do. You have once she does the letter for you, you have 180 days to apply for the credit. So there, it is time sensitive. And um, I just can't emphasize enough, this is just such a really great, great program. Okay, so let me get back to the slide here. We'll go to the next slide. Um, I kind of went over a little bit about AZA already, but um, it's a network of more than 600 zoo and aquarium professionals, organizations, and suppliers all share a commitment with 
to wildlife conservation, education, science, and animal care. It also welcomes public members who support the conservation work of zoos and aquariums. And this is just a link to AZA's diversity and, in, and inclusivity policy. So that is very important to the zoo and aquarium profession that we have the most diverse workforces in place across all of its various members and we offer equal opportunities. So you can read that at your leisure. Um, here's just a recap of a part of it. Um, I'm not gonna read it to you. You can read it, like I said, at your opportunity, but they are committed to this. And this is something that is looked at in the accreditation process that, that all zoos that are members have a process for this. We have a committee, an entire committee dedicated to diversity and inclusion. Then this is a list of those other regional zoo associations that I told you about. So depending on where you actually live, you know, everyone's participating in the MAR program online. So you could be anywhere. So um, this might be if you have an interest in pursuing a records management job, zoological registrar job in zoos and aquariums, some of these others might have relevancy to you. We also have role specific associations. So the American Association of Zookeepers, the Association of Zoo Veterinary Technicians, and then again, the Zoological Registrar Association. And we do, ZRA does partner with these other associations um, because there's, there's quite a number of registrars that do other jobs. So they might be an animal keeper at, at the smaller zoos in particular. They might be responsible for registrar duties, keeper duties, or registrar duties, and um, they might also be a vet tech. So you'll see a lot of that um, in the smaller zoos. So ZRA was formed in 1984 with a small group of 12 people across you know, quite a few zoos, same duties. And, and that's how the, there, that was the very beginning of the zoological re registrar position development. There were a handful of, they were more historians at that time than they were actual registrars. But um, they all had seemed to have either a museum studies or an MLIS degree. And they kind of rose to the top because they had that additional awareness and those additional credentials that helped them deal with the historic, the historical aspect of records, the archives, but it was all paper-based back then. Then in the mid 1980s, AZA created a record standard and had to have a position responsible and, tra and trained in the management of animal records. During the 10 years that followed the deployment of that standard, ZRA's membership doubled. So as I was saying before about how standards really help, this is case in point here. Um, and so the reason why this happened in the 80s was in the 70s, that's when the majority of all the wildlife laws and regulations began to deal with the exploitation of wildlife. Companies, people were importing wildlife like it was candy and doing whatever they wanted to with it. And they were starting to see scientists working with, you know, all kinds of projects in the wild were seeing a decline. And so the Convention on International Trade in Endangered and Threatened Species, or CITES, was an international um, law that was put into effect to protect wildlife, to monitor trade. And then the Endangered Species Act was U.S. specific, but had the same teeth, the same level of protection that CITES did. And of course, then we had the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which monitored all the activities and, and restricted activities with migratory birds, whether in the US or internationally. So all these laws, and that's just a few, there's many more, injurious wildlife, just all kinds of laws and acts. And so the profession became overnight heavily regulated, right? 
So zoos were spinning around going, oh my gosh, you know, now what do we have to do to be able to acquire animals and disposition animals? And, and then, and also science was advancing. There was more and more research being done on captive animal collections. So those two things led to, it can no longer be curators, each doing their own permits, dealing with the records. It was too decentralized and unorganized. It had to be managed by a single professional and, and aquariums followed a little slower, but most of the big zoos and medium zoos, and now, you know, you see with the smaller zoos, they just add those duties to the responsibility of someone else. But nonetheless, they meet the standard by doing that. Um, so the zoological registrar position is recognized and supported by AZA. Many registrars participate in AZA committees and um, training courses. The Zoological Registrar Association is the professional re uh, association representing and advancing the registrar position within the zoological community. So it garners a high level of respect at this point. It's been around for a long time and participated in, in a lot of great projects that have been able to raise its level of respect in the community. And it started out with 12 members. It's now, I think, over 300 members now. So it's grown a lot. Um, so this is the link. I'm not going to pop over there right now, but this is the website. There's a, there's a job description posted under general resources that gives you, this is sort of the best case if you could have the perfectly structured registrar job that, of course, across all of our 300 members, the consensus that this is the best job description, we have put one together for the registrar and the assistant registrar jobs, and we promulgate those to AZA so that if they have members looking to create this position, they have this from the industry, you know, from the position specific association to, to be able to follow. <clears throat> so records management and compliance. So scientific based information is very important and valued in zoos. Um, we, we have a global web based record keeping system that we use and many other about 1200 other zoos and aquariums use it's called the Zoological Information Management System. And it tracks husbandry information as well as medical information. But husbandry information is on a day-to-day -day basis, the animal keepers working directly with the animals are training animals. They're providing enrichment, which is could be anything from a, a ball or a, a bone presented a certain way or or like great apes, it might be something that's filled with something and they have to use a tool or work to get it out. That's enriching their lives by giving them something to do that they would be doing it if they were still in the wild, right? And then animal welfare is just their, their quality of life. Um, you know, their needs are being met, um, specific needs by species that we're meeting their needs when we ship them, that we're shipping them in a way that doesn't cause them stress and that, you know, make sure that they arrive in good and healthy condition. And then of course the medical records. So zoological activities with wildlife again are highly regulated. So legal compliance for animal transactions and parts thereof, which means biological samples. So many times I'm importing animals, but I'm also, because we have 10 conservation centers around the world, our researchers are often importing biological samples for research. And those have all the same requirements from a permitting standpoint that a live animal shipment would. So I have to, I have to keep up on all those laws and regulations and make sure that we retain the records that, that are needed to meet minimum legal requirements. Um, okay, let's, let's see. So this is just an excerpt from the job description, but um, this, um, when we were working on this, my contributions included statements like this. That was pulled directly from the ICRM descriptions um, for managing both active and inactive animal records, because we do that. 
um, and ensuring data quality, appropriate retention, preservation, and accessibility. That had to be in there, just like that has to be in the standards. That has to be so that registrars understand this is relevant. You're not just working in the global animal record keeping database. You're dealing with shipping documentation and all of these things. And how is that retention mandated for your zoo or your profession? Is, is there a local city state mandate for retention that you have to follow? So this is just making sure that they understand how to find that information and how to apply it to animal records and veterinary records. So you can see a lot of this. And then, and then we have the industry specific aspect. So if we weren't managing records in a zoo, if we were managing records for say energy or pharmaceutical, you'd still have that line in there. It would just be all those specific federal and state local requirements for that industry, for pharmaceutical or energy. In this case, it's for wildlife stuff, but it's, it's the same process. It's the same core competency. It's compliance, right? All right. Um, and this is just additional um, kind of Um, you know, how animal records are managed in the database and how training is accomplished. Um, we have, most registrars have to do the annual animal census. So you have to, you know, it's a standard, an AZA accreditation standard that you have an animal inventory done every year because that basically documents your assets related to the animal collection. And then, um, participating in ZRA, regional zoo associations, and other appropriate professional associations in an effort to develop and set standards for animal records and information management. Okay, so just always elevating the level of professionalism for the registrar position. We have a professional development committee. In fact, um, Sarah Wang, who was our first virtual you know, she was already, she had interned and was already interning at San Diego Zoo. And so this was her second opportunity to do something for a zoo. And I think pretty sure she's been bitten by the zoo bug. So she joined ZRA and she joined our professional development committee and most likely will be participating in our first update to our training certificate program. It's an online training program that uh, covers all the core competencies and job duties for a registrar job. And it also has a REM module, which is what I was saying Lisa Dalmi helped, helped us on. So this is a great, you know, if you're looking into the zoo registrar position as an opportunity, a possible career, you'd absolutely want to join ZRA as far as possible just to start monitoring the listserv and plugging into some of these resources, taking the training certificate program, Again, we offer the ICRM mentorship program. We partner, ZRA partners with the ICRM every year to host a ZRA specific. Uh, it's been virtual the last couple of years, but we've, we've hosted in-person exam prep workshops since 2008. So this year we're virtual again, and we're actually partnering with the ARMA Kelowna Conference. So it'll be a three-way partnership but the training certificate program is very economical. It's all online. If you're a member of ZRA, we have a scholarship that we administer through the professional development committee. So you can get, um, you, you can attend one workshop of your choice, either for CRA, CRM, or the part six. So for someone graduating from the MARA program, the part six workshop might be something that you would consider taking because that actually gives you a opportunity to write us a sample business case. And then we review the suggested answer for you. So just reinforcing what is required for part six, because if you're going to be a CRM, even with the credit for parts one through five, no one gets a credit for part six to get your CRM. You'll have to take part six. Um, so the TCP provides entry-level training resources and professional development. It also serves as the benchmark for evolving best practices that can be helpful to long-term members. Um, I always say, if you have been a registrar for 20, 
30 years and you haven't taken any kind of <laughs> either webinars or courses or got your certification or anything like that on current global best practices for records management, at least take this training program because you're probably lacking some skills. I mean, it just changes so quickly. Now you can't, you can't do this job on autopilot like back when it was paper. You, could, you can't do it that way anymore. So really, really important. Um, there's six modules that are part of the training certificate program. And again, module two is specific to uh, REM. We talk a lot about the resources through ARMA. We talk a lot about the ICRM. We give the basic steps towards the life cycle management competencies. So there's more awareness. And then we refer them to certification for the deep dives. This is a link to AZA jobs. So most all the registrar positions that come, become available, they do get to sent to ZRA and we put them on the listserv, but AZA has a pretty robust job board. So I would suggest if, you know, like I said, if you're interested, I would start monitoring that regularly because we still do have a lot of registrars retiring and positions are coming up open a lot more frequently these days. Associate membership in DRA, again, does not require you to be a zoological registrar, but it gives you access to the listserv and where job postings are shared. Now let's, uh, let's end with talking a little bit about the virtual internship opportunity with the St. Louis Zoo. So we're just so proud. I do so many virtual internships now, not only with San Jose State, but with others. Once we have the process solidified and streamlined and you know we know what we're doing now with how to manage this with virtual check-ins and doing the training in a virtual way and we we just can't thank san jose state university enough to give this our opportunity to do this and i really hope that we can get some more uh, virtual internships from san jose state so this is the i'll actually pop over here this is where our internship is listed. So this is the database. And then if you just go down here and put uh, in the institution name, scroll to uh, St. Louis Zoo. Let's see where it is. St. Louis Zoo. And then I think all you have to do is just hit search and it'll bring it up. And so brought it up and then you can read this Megan if this is something that you think you might want to try um, we have a lot of projects that we do that cover all these different uh, core competencies so we do a lot of conversion you know we're still I still have departments coming to me all the time going ah, I found all these paper records down in the basement blah, blah, blah. so we have to we have to go through them, review them, check them against the retention schedule, determine if it's still records. Is it arc, are they vital records? Are they, you know, what, what's their appraised value today? And then if they need to be retained, then we then we put them into our document management system. We use a system called DocuWare. And so that turns into a lot of projects that we can extend to um the interns and externs that we work with with all the university programs. So I've done since since we started virtual with San Jose, uh, we have interns from LSU, from Denver, from um, St. John's University. We have a local um, uh, Southwestern Illinois College. So we're adding more and more. St. Louis University, we've been working with them forever in person, but we've done some virtual ones now. I get interns from their health and information management degree program every year. So um, we have a uh, migration project that was just completed with our Zims Medical, so all the medical records. We also completed one with an intern from SLU this year that had to be, not this year, but last year, um, again, conversion from paper records into DocuWare for our Institute of Conservation Medicine program. 
We have a big project this year that's focusing on the duplication aspect required by Missouri Animal Health for our medical records. So they're in the global database, but they have to be duplicated in another location for five years. And so we're using DocuWare for that as well. But we have 10 file cabinets of stuff that has to be, you know, the part, the administrator on site will go through and determine what gets scanned in the DocuWare. And then the scanning and the indexing will be an intern project. We also have another couple of departments that are left to roll out our ZIMS enrichment module. So that's an onboarding project. We've placed, uh, Sarah, Sarah did two of those for us. Um, and it's a matter of adding the approved enrichment items to ZIMS and then assigning those items to all the animals that are in that department and that are relevant. Doing that in tests to learn how to do it and then going into the live database and doing all of that onboarding so that the keepers who have extremely limited time um, they, they would never get to do this if they had to spend all that time entering those records. So by us being able to outsource that to the interns and externs gives makes it possible for us to roll those things out in a timely way. And it also gives interns and externs an excellent project to work on that's too specific. Okay, so let's go back. And I think that might be... See, so this is specific to the um, animal enrichment. Um, so you will, the learning outcomes with that is you will learn the enrichment manager role because that's the role that adds all the items and does all the assignments. And then we also have, we are developing our online ZIMS training program. So all of the training that we do for anyone that's gonna be using that program at our zoo, we are taking all of that and making an online program to be rolled out hopefully by April 1. So if someone would happen to come on board as an intern or extern right now, they would probably beta test those new courses for us. And they might actually get to help build some of those courses in ThinkEffect. And that's the program that we'll be using. And I've got 15 minutes. So Megan, do you have any questions? Um, so it sounds like it, it, this is more towards a Mara certificate. At the moment, I'm I'm in the MLIS part. <laughs> it's it's um, towards heavy. Yeah, you, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to exclude you in any way. It's. Oh, no. um, I don't think it's limiting though. We have students that that do stuff for us from other programs that are strictly MLIS or MLS. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I did try to apply for the virtual internship earlier um, before the spring semester started. I think it took me to like a more general <laughs> application. So maybe I need to revisit that. <laughs> were you were you were you the one that's that had indicated interest originally and then you weren't able to do it? Uh, no, I was never contacted. Oh, OK, <laughs> OK, because I did have a student the last time I gave this talk. And they were really excited. And then something happened with their time commitment. And they weren't able to do it. Um, yeah, I probably messed up on the application or something. <laughs> Is who, who should she talk to, Dara, maybe, if she wants to try this on making sure she does the application correctly? Well, I'm always happy to help in any way I can. But our internship supervisor is actually Dr. Linda Main. Oh, OK. Yeah, and, and, and feel free, like once you go there and you update and you, and you decide if you want to apply, um, just reach out and start communicating with me directly because uh, we have to have you apply through our volunteer services department as well to meet the St. Louis Zoo requirements. Oh, I see. Okay, great. That's not too difficult. <laughs> 
Those projects look very interesting, the enrichment and the creation of the online training programs. I, I'm actually a career transitioner. I was a uh, teacher. <laughs> oh. So yeah, that would be great. And then um, we have a very small zoo over in uh, Folsom. It's, it's different from the Sacramento Zoo in that they're more about um, rescuing animals that can't mm-hmm. longer like go back into the wild. Um, but it's right. a big part of their programming is enrichment and um, demonstrating to the public um, what these animals are capable mm-hmm. of. So like, for example, last summer when people started going camping more, they gave the bear a, a cooler to, <laughs> to play with but to, to, to show like, okay, this right. is why we use bear walk, uh, bear lockers. <laughs> Have yeah. you ever seen all the enrichment that they give like the orangutans and stuff? Because, you know, they build in the wild, they build their nest every night. So they'll put straw and paper and they're flinging it everywhere and building these you know, these complicated structures of stuff and then they crawl into it and that's like their nest for the night. If they didn't have that stuff, they wouldn't be able to do what they do, you know, in building their nest. Right. And I like how the community around the zoo really supports the zoo. They, I guess there was a pumpkin farmer had a lot of leftovers after uh, Halloween. Mm-hmm. So the, it, almost every single animal had pumpkins to mess with. And yet <laughs> the squirrels, uh, squirrel, he's loved it. <laughs> they love pumpkin is very, very popular. <laughs> very true. Well, this sounds great. And I will tell you, so we do, we are building the training courses for Zims, but we're also, um, and my, my employee, Lily, she's the assistant registrar. She's, she does a lot of the work with the interns on uh, actually teaching them how to add all the stuff to Zims. Um, but we also have about six modules for DocuWare, which you know, we're going to be busy with trying to get all this stuff converted over to online training for a while. Zims will probably need to be done by April 1, but then I'm going to need help with the DocuWare stuff as well. So there's there's plenty of work with that. Um, And then we have one other module that we have to do for SharePoint. But if you have a preference for animal-specific stuff, uh, if we can get you approved and get you through all that process, I'm Like I said, there's no shortage of projects. Wow. Great. Sounds great. great. Okay. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for having me again, Dara. And um, I should probably be calling you Dr. Hoffman. I apologize. I'm just so used to- Oh, it's okay. I have everyone call me here. I'm quite comfortable (laughs) with my, just going by my first name. But no, thank you so much for taking the time to prepare this and join us. I always learn so much when you join us and I'm- (laughs) really grateful for your time and expertise and I think as for the students especially it's a really valuable perspective to to see what records management looks like you know out Mm -hmm. in the real world because Mm -hmm. we've had uh you're the third presentation this year we've had uh a gentleman who works with UNESCO and or sorry Mm -hmm. with the UN and has done like registered records management through South Sudan and those kinds of projects and then we had someone from the Harvard libraries talking about nice. digital preservation. And so it's, I think it's great that they can see how diverse uh, the profession really is when you go mm-hmm. out and, you know, roll up your sleeves and get into this world. That's great. Well, I do have a question. Um, once this recording is shared, am I able to share that with anyone? Absolutely. It will be up on our YouTube channel. Okay. Um, but I will um, ask as well about how you could, you know, share it if beyond just, you know, sharing to a link to our YouTube. Okay. That sounds great. Great. Again, I look forward to hearing from you and thank you so much again for the time today. Thank you.